one, we have with us Ross Brewer, Chief Revenue Officer at SimSpace. Today, we'll be talking about SimSpace and the battle-ready cybersecurity solutions that it provides, um, how businesses in the region can protect their strategic assets and key data in the context of accelerated digital transformation and the plans that SimSpace has for the region. So much to look forward to. Welcome, Ross. Great to have you here. Thanks, Anita. It's a pleasure. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Ross. Um, Ross, so uh, let's begin with a brief um, introduction about SimSpace and your business and offerings. Yes, thank you. So, so SimSpace uh, comes from our, our founder, Hutch, who was a F-15 fighter pilot. Uh, he then went into mm -hmm. the Pentagon and into one of the three letter agencies and was asked by General Alexander, who was the four-star general that set up Cyber Command, to build right. out a training capability for the US mm -hmm. uh, military. And he joined mm -hmm. with uh, Lee Rossi, who's our co-founder. And Lee was with Lincoln Laboratory as part of MIT. And so mm -hmm. Lee specialized in building simulation environments. So they they created uh, SimSpace, uh, the, the platform, which is our Cyberforce platform. And it's really broken down into three uh, offerings. We provide military grade cyber rangers, um, mm -hmm. elite force training, and mm -hmm. the live fire exercises. And, and this is what we built uh, for the uh, US Cyber Command that we're now making available to allied organizations and countries and critical national infrastructure throughout the region and the Gulf. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, tell us, how do you help organizations develop their cybersecurity teams, protect their strategic assets and manage risk overall? We, we help organizations move from, the, there's a number of sort of uh, maturity uh, aspects that the uh, organizations, uh, so if you take financial services as an example, they're looking to sort of move beyond the classic capture the flag tabletop exercise where they really want to do live team uh, sort of mission rehearsal, just like the military do. So we provide uh, cyber rangers uh, that help uh, organizations, institutions, critical national infrastructure do exactly that. So we were uh, last week, uh, we were in the Gulf region uh, at a country level working with one of the big four auditors. Uh, we were supporting an event they held, which was a national uh, war game exercise uh, for the uh, uh, you know country level financial services group of the top um, banks. And they were run through as sort of a two day, a sort of a technical uh, exercise, an immersive technical exercise using uh, sim space and then a, a business exercise for the executives for the following day. And we're looking to sort of repeat that uh, with sort of, you know, leading financial services organizations throughout the Gulf uh, at, at the moment. So, so what we do is we help organizations answer a, a number of sophisticated, complex questions they can't answer with their teams and in their production environment today. In other words, they have all of these highly skilled individuals, but how do they operate as a team and how do they operate under pressure? So for instance, one of the biggest banks in the world last October, we did a 24 hour event where we collapsed three years of attacks into a 24 hour window. And that organization wanted to see how their shift pattern uh, handover would work. So there was three eight hour uh, shift uh, patterns within that 24 hour window. And we put the teams through their paces. And so it really helps organizations really understand the communications, the um, delegation, the collaboration, the sort of human skills, if you will, on whether or not they uh, are going to be up to the required sort of strength in, in time of need, i.e. when there's a serious attack. Right. And that's a very, um, very um, interesting take on uh, the whole cybersecurity uh, management um, area. Now, tell us about uh, cyber ranges. How critical is it to an organization's comprehensive security readiness program? And what are the different cyber ranges delivery models and how does it, uh, you know, how does its simulation work for customers? So, so cyber ranges help organizations really answer a number of questions of their people 
uh, processes and technology that they're struggling to answer in their production environments today. There is there is testing that goes on to test controls, and I come from a background in that that industry segment myself. And however, with a range, it creates a sort of a consequence-free, safe environment that organisations can work in and really turn up the heat, if you will. So in production, if you want to do some red teaming or some penetration testing or some activity in production, you might be able to turn the volume up to a, you know, a two. Uh, you don't want to break anything. You don't want to break the people and you don't want to create too much noise that it blinds the security operations center to their normal activities. So by using a, a range which is separate from production, you can really turn the temperature up and test technologies and people and processes uh, to, to, to that sort of much higher uh, sort of impact level. And then the range has an, uh, an additional benefit of being able to do all sorts of things within that range and answer other sort of sophisticated questions. Like for instance, they might, an organization might be looking to rationalize the number of security controls they have. So how do they, well, they might have overlap and obviously a lot of security controls means complexity. So how can they reduce that complexity and know that they can swap some of their tools out, reduce the cost of them without losing protection and without losing the overall effectiveness of their capability. So there's many use cases for the range and that that's some of them. Mm -hmm. And then the delivery models are it can be provided as software, it can be provided uh, as a, a SaaS uh, sort of hosted solution, or it can be provided with, with the hardware. Now, a lot of the critical national infrastructure work, uh, Ministry of Defense work, intelligence community work that we do, these organizations wanna be in control of the data and they wanna be mm. in control of the assets. So these are typically closed, they're not connected to their production network, they're not connected to the internet, and they're often on, you know, the old traditional on-prem uh, approach, if you will. Absolutely, and um, it's good to see that, you know, a lot of work is being done to reduce the complexity that, uh, you know, too many controls bring in. Um, now, uh, uh, SimSpace recently announced its expansion in the EMEA APJ market. What opportunity do you see in the Middle East market uh, and in which segments specifically? Well, uh, as I said last week, uh, was in the region, uh, was in Saudi, uh, was in UAE uh, and uh, other countries. And we are just uh, looking to uh, appoint uh, our distributor. Uh, in, in the region. Uh, the announcement will come from that in the coming uh, period here. And there's a huge uh, opportunity because if you look at the, the, the LEAP conference as an example, I uh, managed to attend that on the first day. Uh, by four o'clock, there had been a notification. And in fact, I had to leave to go to the airport. So I happened to come out of the conference at that time. And there were hundreds of people milling around the, the doorways. and. I sort of thought, well, this is interesting. There must be some dignitaries here and people want to sort of see the dignitaries. But it actually turned out when I got to the airport, there was a notification to say that they'd closed the doors because they had too many people uh, at the event. That's four o'clock on the first day. Uh, and so if you look at the amount of activity and the volume of cybersecurity work that's going on in the region, especially in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we have a huge uh, opportunity. And the great thing about the region is that most of the organizations, they want the best uh, and they want to really move to the highest level of capability that they can. And that fits nicely with what we're doing around helping organizations sort of move to this sort of continuous uh, security improvement model uh, that, that we can do by not only providing uh, training for their individuals, but training for their teams, these exercises that measure, and then they can show uh, progression and maturity over time as we continue to do this over a you know one, two, three, five year period. Absolutely. So now that brings me to um, the region uh, in particular. Um, now, the Middle East cybersecurity market size is projected to grow, grow from USD 20.3 billion in 2022 to, to US dollar 44.7 billion by 2027. So how do you 
how is simspace planning to utilize this huge opportunity and what are your plans for the region anything that we should look forward to well i got a huge history in the region, uh, been very successful there with previous uh, organisations and previous teams. And with that growth, uh, I, I've always made it uh, very clear to my colleagues around the world that in terms of the Gulf region, it's, it's a little unique in as much that it's still in sort of infrastructure, sort of creation and infrastructure build mode where I would see some of the other countries, maybe in Europe, maybe even in the US to a certain extent, where it's more in maintenance mode. Uh, you know, all the highways were built uh, in in the US in the 50s and they're, they're all there. Uh, so if you're, if you're driving a concrete truck and in the 50s, you were a very wealthy person and you had a lot of work to do. Well, whereas you look at cybersecurity in the Gulf, it's at that stage of uh, it's it's a huge market already, and it's going to double in size. and And it's it's the sort of it's a hidden gem, if you will, for cybersecurity companies that understand that and know how to operate uh, through partners and know how to culturally and and locally support the market in the way that you need to to be successful. And if you can sort of unlock that that uh, lock with the right key. Uh, it can be a phenomenally successful market. And so, uh, you know, hiring local teams, uh, you know, local culture, local talent uh, is is critical and watch the space as we develop and and uh, expand and, and do all the things that um, uh, we've done in the past to to make uh, the event, the sorry, the region so successful. And in my previous role and, and, and previous roles, uh, we've even got to the point where the, the Gulf region has uh, produced as much as 50% of the global revenues for a company, which is given the size of the market, that's a pretty uh, huge uh, outcome. Right. Uh, now, cyber threats are a constant concern. And how do you prepare for the future, um, you know, as far as threats which may not be existent now? What are the unique trend, trend, threats or trends specific to this region that you intend to focus on? And how do you ensure that the talent acquired for the same remains versatile and uh, equipped to face new challenges? I think that's a really important question, a very interesting question. And I think obviously AI is going to be a huge play in, in what's going on. And we've we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, sort of chat APT or or, or, or or whichever AI technology you want to talk about. And I think there's some risks around that, that uh, people may be getting a little bit lazy in programming and programming and using these kind of tools to provide code for them. Uh, potentially there's a maltraining aspect to those technologies where you could create a, a world where you sort of maltrain the AI so that it's producing code that's got embedded vulnerabilities in it. Uh, there's a risk there. These technologies are not designed to check the code. They're just designed to produce what they've heard about and what they think that they've been told that they is, is good, right? So I think AI, quantum computing is going to make a big difference, but that's not going to be in the short term. That's going to be in the medium term. But people need to think about that because that's going to have a big impact on the algorithms and that's going to fundamentally change all of security. Uh, I'm not sure that's in the next one to three years. It's probably more in the three to five year range, but I think AI in the next one to three years. And then the risk of, I've said this on another podcast recently, uh, what I call the Wuhan of uh, cybersecurity. And, and my concern is that it's not only all the vendors that are working on AI, what about the um, adversarial actors and the nation state actors? What's happening on their side on AI where they're producing an AI capability that po possibly gets out of the lab and gets onto the network. Think of Stuxnet uh, in the, the old days here, but you, and think go back 15, 20 years to the worms of old, where you get some piece of AI that gets onto the internet and starts propagating. It doesn't. It's just trained to do that. It just tries a whole lot of different techniques uh, and maybe even develops its own uh, to try and propagate and replicate itself. And before you know it, you've got the snowball effect of slowing down the internet and chewing up a whole lot of resource because this thing gets out of control and and uh, and is you know is is propagating around the internet so i think some of those things but i think if we come back to just the reality of here and now there's a big digital hygiene problem in the industry 
and people need to focus on the basics. And this is making sure that their teams are trained on the technologies that they have, making sure that if you look at the data breach investigation uh, report of Verizon two years ago, they were saying that 85% of breaches stem from a human failure. So our human is our best line of defense, but it's also our biggest weakness. So I think the shift has to happen where we put increasingly more effort into our resources, training them as individuals, training them as teams, testing them uh, in under pressure, identifying their weaknesses, and then filling those weaknesses in with people or process or additional training. Absolutely. I think the point that you raised about hygiene, the cyber hygiene is, is very, very valid, particularly today when, you know, um, cybersecurity, I mean, digital transformation is accelerating and cybersecurity is keeping pace, but there's a whole bunch of things around it that need to be channelized and need to be streamlined. So that's a very valid point. And I can see that um, uh, SimSpace is doing a lot of lot of very relevant work, um, not only in the region, but also uh, globally. Um, Ross, that was that was uh, amazing talking to you. Thank you so much for the insights. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us. Thank you, Anita, for your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing the article and uh, I wish everybody the success in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much.